If we were going to disassemble a great screenplay, take it apart and examine it, what would we find? Uh, if, if we disassemble a great screenplay, um, try to reverse engineer it and, and construct our own based on that, uh -huh. um, what you uh, would find in it is uh, various, let's call them techniques or tools that a screenwriter has used to keep the audience engaged. So that when you are, when the curtain goes up or you click the button and it says streaming, <laughs> that, that uh, from that moment uh, there are, they're manipulating your mind, your brain, uh, using various tools and techniques so that uh, to keep you uh, going from moment to moment. And um, the, the, the first book that I did, the, the sequence approach. Oh, let's this, see it. This, this, this fine volume okay. um, was actually, uh, it, it sequences are in the title and it's the, how the organizing principle of the book. But I actually thought sequences are kind of like the hook to get the reader to learn about all the other things techniques that you can use to keep an audience interested. Um, so it's like there hadn't been a book explicitly about the sequence approach before this. Um, and so I thought, well, that's a good angle to use. But there's, once you get the concept, it's pretty simple to understand. Um, but what goes on in the sequences and what tools that filmmakers use, storytellers use to keep you interested, that's fascinating to me too. And so this was, a, I thought, a good way um, to get you interested so that you can learn, learn about these other things that, that filmmakers do. Um, and uh, so specifically, the kinds of things you'll find, um, let, let's, let's start out at the beginning. <laughs> what do you do? Um, there is a lot of thought and work out there about three act structure and the act structure, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in the very beginning of a movie, you can throw all that out. It's not really about that sort of thing. It's really about, it tends to be about human curiosity. A, can you come up with a puzzle? Can you come up with some interesting uh, image or some line of dialogue or something that is puzzling. It leaves a gap in our understanding and makes us wonder uh, uh, what the answer is. And people, many times, the, com the, the common wisdom was, you got to hook an audience, a reader, in the first 10 pages of your screenplay. Okay? You got to hook them by the first 10 pages. And I always felt that there's no reason why you can't hook them on the first page. All you have to do is raise a question in the, in the reader's mind on the first page and then promise them an answer on page two. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll turn the page. You know, implicitly, you know, you'll get an answer. Uh, and then on page two, it, you get the answer, but then there's maybe a couple more, qu more questions raised. And then you want to find out, and you keep turning, and then once you, you're in there, you're hooked. Um, so the reader's hooked. Uh, so generally, you, you'll see we'll begin with some kind of puzzle, uh, something that is, um, intrigues us. Uh, possibly the main character, but not always, is involved in that. And then um, as the answers come, you can get um, a uh, start to get to know a person, usually the classical formulation. You uh, see oftentimes somebody struggling to try to get something, and then they get it. We don't really know them yet, but we start to develop a sense of connection with a character. Um, and that, if we're looking at a main character hooked in the first uh, part of the page, uh, introduced early in this film, they're not always that way, but uh, often, then um, once you're there, then you're going to see uh, tools, um, well, I guess we can talk about what I identify in the book as the four main tools uh, that filmmakers use in, uh, that I've observed screenwriters and by extension filmmakers use in keeping an audience engaged. And um, 
the most obvious one that you'll see uh, goes by a couple different names. Uh, it's, I call it telegraphing, which can be a negative thing in acting. You're not supposed to telegraph your emotions, that kind of thing, but it's a different sense of the term. Telegraphing, or it's also known as advertising. It's also known as, uh, in theater, I've seen it called uh, signposts or finger posts. It's just simply telling the audience what is coming. Uh, a purely narrative function. And the thing to keep in mind is that drama, unlike a novel, drama uh, is about something that hasn't happened yet. So it's particularly obsessed with the future. It's about what's creating anticipation in the audience. A novel, you've got a narrator, the narrator tells you something that already happened before. Uh, and you can rely on the narrator to give you all the information. Uh, a play and a movie hasn't happened yet. And that's why you'll see since the beginning, they are a stage play and a screenplay. They're instructions and they're written in the present tense. This goes here, this goes there, this person does that. And then, so that's, that's why you have that. So uh, that tense, because it's about, it's a description about something the audience is about to see and how you do that, how the filmmakers or the play uh, actors are supposed to do it. So, uh, with that in mind, telegraphing is, can be something as simple as a character, uh, what's called an appointment. A character says, um, uh, I'll uh, meet you at Jerry's Juiceteria at five o'clock. Okay. So what does that mean? Um, because film is selective, we don't generally start a camera and just keep it running for an hour and a half. You cut to different places. You like to keep the audience oriented. So if you tell the audience, uh, two characters say, I'm see you at Jerry's Juice of Terry at five o'clock and we'll talk then. Then when you cut to Jerry's Juice of Terry, you don't have to explain why you're there. <clears throat> You've already anticipated it. Um, so a simple appointment is an example of that. A deadline has more emotional freight to it. It's like you have a certain number of hours to get a certain thing done. Um, and so uh, it can put time pressure on a character. But also, it also shapes the overall picture, picture too. Uh, it, can, it can be used for that. Uh, for example, there's a, a couple of these that have deadlines. 500 days of summer comes along. Okay, so it's gradually counting up. It skips around, but you know when you get to 500, eh, the story's going to be over. Uh, Julie and Julia, I think it was called. Okay, so what was that? They're going to do um, the... Uh, uh, all the recipes in the book, one a day. Okay. So when you get to recipe 300, guess what? You know, the movie's probably going to end before pretty soon. <laughs> You're not going to go on another hour or two. And, and that helps shape uh, an audience's um, sense of where to invest its energy. I think we've all been in a situation where we watch a movie, we think it's over and then it just keeps going. I thought it was done. And then we're sapped of energy and we're like, how, long, how much longer is this going on? Uh, and that just simply means that the filmmaker hasn't, the storyteller hasn't signaled to the audience properly when the big moment is. And sometimes you can do that with simple telegraphing. The movie I'm trying to think of in American Beauty, it begins with a voice, a disembodied voice saying, in, uh, in a year I'll be dead. That's a deadline for you. You know, and so this is... Um, give us a sense, well, we're going to, this movie will take place in, over the course of a year. You know that implicitly. Okay, so that happened at the beginning of that movie. More typically, uh, telegraphing is just used internally to give, keep us oriented. Um, you have uh, in Toy Story, the opening, it's well, very well-crafted movie, uh, where you have uh, the birthday parties coming. So you just have a, a sign that says birthday, happy birthday. So we know what's about to happen. Um, and then there's a reference to we're moving in a week. Okay, so there's a deadline. This movie will take place in one week. Um, and it helps, or let's go to Pizza Planet. These are all examples within it. So now we're going there. And there's another couple of scenes between that moment. Um, so that's, that's one tool that you will see in, the, in movies that manage the tension and keep you interested and keep you going. Um, that one has purely narrative function, not really uh, emotional. Uh, one that has more emotion is, uh, I talked about this before, it's a term called uh, dangling cause. 
you have cause and effect, and uh, this term applies to a cause that doesn't have an effect immediately. It dangles. So uh, it's uh, instead of a character saying, um, instead of a boy likes girl, therefore boy kisses girl, it's boy likes girl and says, I will kiss her, you know, before the day is up. <laughs> and then you'll have a bunch of scenes, and, but you're waiting, you're, it pushes the audience's attention into the future. Well, is it going to happen or not? Um, so you'll have a character give a warning to somebody, a warning, a threat, don't you dare come back here, if I see you here again, I'm going to whatever. Um, a prediction, an expression of hope. I just hope that that this is uh, that that you know I'll survive today or something like that, or I'll learn what I need to learn. But if a character does that again. That is something that creates anticipation. So you will tend in a well-made movie to see that sort of technique being used. Uh, the thing you don't want to have is the audience wondering where is this going. I don't know where this is going, or the reader. I, I've read 10 pages, I have no idea what the story is. Well, if you put these little things in there, embroider the script with these elements, these tools, then you're going to help allay that problem. Um, the next tool that you see is dramatic irony. Uh, this is uh, one where a character knows, uh, the audience knows more than one or more of the characters. And it has some salient uh, that creates a, a salient issue for the scene. The character doesn't know there's somebody behind the uh, wall waiting with a gun to shooting them. You know, so what are we worried about? Why are we in, in tune with that? Because uh, attuned to it? Because <clears throat> we want to find out what happens when the character figures it out. This moment of recognition. Oh my God. Uh, or um, it could be obviously a threat that creates suspense. It could be used for comic irony um, to people that uh, uh, are talking and we don't know that one of them is sleeping in the other person's bed without them knowing about it. You know, that every scene, uh, there's a movie, uh, The Shop Around the Corner, which was remade decades later uh, as You've Got Mail, about two clerks, the first one was about two clerks working in a shop who are each corresponding to somebody that they haven't met yet, that they are in love with. And they don't realize that it's actually each other. And in person, they can't stand each other. So every scene, every scene that has those two in it uh, has an extra layer of excitement to it. And it leads us to this anticipation. What's going to happen when they find out the truth? Um, so that's dramatic irony. And then the fourth tool is the one that gets all the press. Uh, and that you'll hear about relentlessly is this idea of dramatic tension, uh, which is where the three-act structure comes in. And that's just character wants something, we care about that character, and we are in suspense about whether they're going to get it. And that one you can sustain for a whole feature film or longer. Um, and you'll see it though in subunits. Uh, you're asking if you deconstruct it, what are you going to find in the screenplay? Well, you will tend to see one unifying tension. And the, the main tension, that one unifying tension, will boy get girl, will girl get boy, will girl get girl, whatever uh, you, how you define it. Um, uh, that um, can be enough to, that, that creates the, the unity in a movie that makes it feel like one movie rather than a whole bunch of scenes stuck together. It's like, what was that about? Well, it was about whether the person would get this. Okay, that's what it's about. Uh, but within that, within the subunits, you have these dramatic scenes. And dramatic scenes can use the same structure. Uh, a dramatic scene will still have a character who wants something, and there's obstacles. And if you, you, know, if you study acting, you'll see that it's drilled into the actors. What's my objective in this scene? What am I trying to do? What is my action? Uh, it's not about emotion. It's about trying to do something. Uh, drama. Drama comes from doing. It's doing things. It's action. Um, so um, within each scene, once you have a connection to a character, you will see this same thing happening. Uh, yes, you have a, a character who... Um, Silver Linings Playbook. 
the character wants to reconnect with his ex-wife. Okay, that's the main question, main tension. Is he going to do that or not? Then within a scene, he may be uh, fighting with his father about whether he should, you know, go out for a run or fix the, the, the window that he broke, right? That's a very different tension, but it's still a tension. And it's built in within a particular scene. Um, you'll also tend to see in successful movies what the, the sequences that um, are, they tend to be invisible to a viewer, but to a writer who's trying to create a movie, they're very useful building blocks. And that is um, seeing, and those, uh, seeing a mini movie, a mini story within the bigger one that is a component of it. And those also tend to have three act structures that it's a nested structure. Uh, you have multiple iterations at different levels. You have at the scene level, character wants something, there's obstacles. But the scenes are in service of a bigger tension. A character has to go through multiple things to try to get to what they want within the, the sequence. And then um, the sequences themselves are built into the overall three-act structure of a dramatic piece. And, and there are issues about how many acts do you have? What are the acts? Should they be four? Should there be none? Um, it's, it's really about how you define the acts and whether you're playing with dramatic tension. If you have, um, uh, if you have a, a main issue about a character wanting something and there's obstacles, you have to know who that character is. You have to connect with them emotionally. You have to know what the obstacles are. You have to, and then once you know those things, you, preferably what's at stake, then the questions would raise, the tension is out there. That's your end of your first act. If you don't know those things, you're not going to have any tension. If a character wants something, if there's two characters, let's say you're in a park and you see two uh, people playing tennis and they're going at it, they're really going at it. Uh, it's not necessarily dramatic to you if they're strangers. It's just two people really going at it. And whether one wins or the other doesn't mean anything. But if you know one of them, and you know that person, you love them dearly, and you found out that they bet their entire uh, fortune on this one game, and you also know that the guy they're playing against, or girl, is a hustler who, who suckered them into it, then that changes your experience of it. You are now f hanging on every shot, and you're hoping that somehow they're going to overcome this. And th that information that makes it dramatic, that's your first act. You, you can't have an, a drama without that. Um, and then the third act simply refers to the resolution of that tension. Because you, <laughs> if you don't have the third act, that means you, you found out that your, that your dearly beloved brother bet everything on this game against a hustler, and it's really intense, and then, well, I gotta go. And we don't find out who wins. Oh, you could probably do that. You probably, people would get a little upset. The audience would feel incomplete. So that's what that three acts is. So deconstructing it, those are the elements that, that you would find. And these, these are the pieces that are keeping us involved uh, from one stage, from one moment in the story to the next. That's a long answer. <laughs> So if we took a not so great or sort of a mediocre, bland screenplay, we put it on the same table and disassembled it, we would see not enough conflict and then we would see maybe, and this is like sort of a bad word, but emotional manipulation within the story because you're saying that these audience, the audience, the readers, they want these clues. They don't want to be given information. Right. Um, well, there's, as they say, there's many more ways of being sick than there are of being healthy. That's <laughs> so, true. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> If we, if we read a script that doesn't quite work for us, then um, obviously the issues are, are manifold. Um, what kinds of mistakes we make? Um, there's a, with my, like with my students, not that my, my students are brilliant and they hardly ever make mistakes, but let's just say there's that outlier that <laughs> makes a mistake once in a while. Um, there's a, uh, um, tendency in no particular order, the things that I see, and I see it in feature films too that don't quite work. 
there is a, there tends to be a misunderstanding of in the scheme that I'm talking about. What does it mean to have the end of the second act? You'll see it there. It's drummed into a lot of them that this is the low point or some kind of all is lost moment or you know everything's hopeless and everything has to get really really bad um, and it's not necessarily so it depends on what your story actually is the end of the second act is where the question is answered but the third act is really it, it's resolved but preferably in a in a way that is uh, turns the story into something deeper. Um, it's uh, Milos Forman said when I studied with Milos Forman at uh, Columbia days, and he put it this way. He said in a in a standard classic feature with drama, the audience has got two usually two possibilities. You know, the person gets it or they don't. So let's say it's hypothesis A or hypothesis B. We hope for hypothesis A. We are afraid it's going to be hypothesis B. But the audience isn't satisfied if the third act is either A or B. It's got to be C. It's got to be something that transforms the way in which we're aware of what the a deeper meaning to the story. Um, and that's what really the function of the third act is. We, we often feel like, okay, the main character doesn't, in the classic formulation that I think most people go by when they're trying to write a script, the character wants, um, I'm going back to, I don't have sex on my mind, but wants the girl, let's just say. <laughs> um, it's easy. Let's say, all right, a bank. They want to make money, let's say. Uh, they want to get their money back from someone who stole it. That, that's, let's say that's it. And they go uh, all through the movie. Once you know that, you know, they take this various action to try to get that objective. Um, then the idea would be at the end of the second act, it doesn't look like they're ever going to get it. Okay? Oh, it's impossible. All odds are against them. But in the third act, they manage to get it. Okay? That's, that's a classical formulation. But there's other ways of seeing it that can be very powerful. Um, and, and I try to encourage my students to examine those when they're, looking, when they're looking at a story, when they're coming up with it. What happens if they get it at the end of the second act, but it isn't what they thought it was? Or they paid a price on it? Or the price was too big? Or they did it, but in the process damaged someone so deeply that now they have to deal with the consequences of what they did? Those are ways of really turning a story and examining the theme and making it powerful. Like examples from the book and the analyses that I do are um, in Toy Story, it's about this guy who wants to maintain his position at the top. That's what it's about. And the question is, A, he maintains it or, or gets it back, or B, he, he never gets it back. That's how it's presented. But at the end of the second act, what happens? Well, it isn't a question of that anymore. He gives up and recognizes that there's, he becomes selfless, selfless. And, and then the two team up. The question isn't answered A or B, it becomes C. We'll, we're going to accept whatever the outcome is, but we're going to help each other. So you wind up with this uh, upli really uplifting ending. Um, in, uh, and you also, when you do this, when you open yourself up to that possibility, uh, it, you can actually reverse the tension in a way. The typical feeling is, I love this character, let's look at the tennis court. I love that character, and they're in deep trouble, and I want them to win. But there are times when the character wants something you don't want them to watch, want. You don't want them to get. And that tension is perfectly valid. And we, we see, like, uh, I go back to a classic, The Apartment, where the main character wants to climb his way to the top. But that's not what we ultimately want for him. What we want is for him to be a true human being uh, who's um, not uh, degrading himself constantly to get to the top. We want him to be a, a full human being uh, who gets uh, true love. That's what we want. That's not what he wants. That's not what he's pursuing through most of it. 
Um, so at the end of the second act, he gets everything he could possibly want. And then doesn't like it. And now we explore like the movie from a different point of view. You take the premise and you flip it. Um, and that's, that's something that I have to work with my students because there's an automatic tendency to just uh, go with the A or B. And, and an example of a movie that I felt, um, a movie that I've seen that I felt could have used a rethinking of it was the, <laughs> I'm probably going to forget the name again. Um, oh, uh, the, Rev the Revenant came out a few years ago. Okay, so it's at root a very simple revenge story. This guy left me for dead and lied about it. And I'm going to just get that guy. So what's the tension? Is he either going to get him or he isn't? And along the way, you know, we have these sub scenes. They're not all against that guy. None of them are. They're all about overcoming the elements and the bad guys and being helped by somebody and the, the winter weather and the river that would have killed him within 30 seconds. But this is Hollywood, so it worked out okay. And so it gets all the way to the end. Now, you're in a position, they, the, managed, the filmmakers managed to put themselves in a position where it was going to be predictable. It's either going to be the final fight, is either going to get the guy or he isn't going to get the guy. And he's probably going to get the guy. And so inevitably, in this kind of movie, where they have limited their options as storytellers, it's going to come down to a fight. And the fight is going to have a moment where the bad guy almost kills him. Maybe there's a knife that... But somehow the good guy finds just enough reserve of energy where I came from, we don't know. But somehow they're able to throw them off and then get the upper hand and they die a horrible, horrible death. In this case, he doesn't kill him, but he does pretty much the same thing to him that was done to him. But look at that story. I mean, I think, what, what are the other options if, you're, if that story comes to me and I'm looking at it, thinking, well, the main character is the guy who wants revenge. Is that even the most interesting character? This is what I would do with a student. Turn this around. What are the other characters here? Well, okay, there's the bad guy. You could always see bad guys don't think they're the bad guy. They think they're doing it right. Uh, they're just living with the times, going with the flow. Okay, so this guy leaves him for dead. Why does he leave him for dead? Well, he thinks that he's going to be a drag on the group and they're all going to die. That's not a bad thing, is it? That's a difficult question. Now, they painted the character as this evil guy, but there's another character there. The, there's an army officer who's leading them. What if it's his, the men are his responsibility? And he almost knows for certain, if we keep this guy, then all my men could die. Now, that's an interesting problem. And so he does something questionable. He leaves him for dead or thinks he's dead. And then he finds out the guy's alive. And that to me is a more interesting dilemma. And the third act could be the confrontation between them, or it could be something more interesting. It's not just going to be A or B. It's going to be, how do I redeem myself? How would I get this person to understand? I didn't do it. What, what, what are the issues? It, it becomes a lot richer of a story. And you can probably still get a, 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 go, a, a go in the river, you know, the frozen river. And you could probably still have that stuff. But you're not locked into something that's just A or B. Um, so uh, that's, that's um, uh, uh, what I see when you're talking about a script that doesn't quite work, a lot of good things in it, but, but it, you're kind of left with, eh, okay, well, let's go home. <laughs> um, it doesn't lead me away. Uh, the, uh, the thing in terms of story development when I work with students, there is uh, this uh, notion that occurred to me. It reminds me of a... There's this old Zen saying, so we can be a little bit Zen here just for shortly, short bit of time. But um, there's a saying that uh, to a beginning student, the rivers are rivers and the mountains are mountains, right? Uh, but to an intermediate student, the rivers are no longer rivers, the mountains are no longer mountains. Uh, to an advanced student, though, guess what? Uh, you know, the rivers are rivers again and the mountains are mountains. Well, I, I see this, uh, you can probably Google that and I'm sure you'll find it. Um, under Zen sayings about mountains. But uh, to a beginning screenwriting student, you want to write a script? Just start writing a script. Okay, write the scenes. Okay, I got this. Okay, I'm going to start writing. And if you put a bunch of scenes together, you'll have a script. You'll have a story. 
an intermediate student learns, no, 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 you have to plan the story first. You got to know what, what is the story? How do you know what scenes you're going to have unless you have a, the story that tells you? Uh, and I've run into this. I've, I, when I read an unsolicited script, very often I start with a lot of notes which are pertaining to the moments, the scenes. And then I realize after a few pages in, wait a minute, I don't even know if the story needs those scenes. I got to figure out what the story is because then I'm wasting my time writing detailed notes on scenes that are, should be thrown out because you don't need them um, or they're not optimal for the story. So that's, that's the intermediate student. But when you get to the advanced level, you realize that, again, going back to constructivist psychology, Characters, uh, audiences don't actually see stories at all. They don't. What do they see? They see scenes. Okay? They see scenes, and in the process of watching the scenes, they construct a story in their minds. They put the scenes together, and they understand there's a story. But the story is not materially present ever. It's always just constructed in our heads. And therefore, since all you see are scenes, when you have a premise, the way you want to develop it, is the way that maximizes the, 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 the amount of really cool scenes in it. That I see, sometimes see students, well, here's a story and I have to stick with it. But the way you've developed the story, you're not allowing for any really interesting scenes. I've seen those scenes. I've seen the ones in Revenant. You know, I've seen in Variations. And I've seen that fight before. But maybe you could turn the story in a way that, yeah, that's going to be a really cool scene. And, and how about that one? You, you, don't you realize if you withhold the information here from the character, now you've got a scene that um, has a double meaning to it. There's a scene in a, a, a script that I consulted on and did a rewrite on, and, and there was a, the father is, um, uh, finds the daughter with a lover he shouldn't, she shouldn't be with, and it's like, you, how could you do that? And it's like, my father, I hate you. And, you know, and it's exactly the kind of scene you'd see any time, anywhere. But my, what, the way I redid it was that the lovers are together and, and they see the father coming and the daughter hides. And the father sees the guy and he's really in a tough mood. He's struggling with his career and he sits down with the guy, with the daughter right there, and he's talking about his relationship with his daughter and how he doesn't understand her and he wants, every, you know, everything is really rich now, you know, because we know that the daughter is hiding there and, and that's a really cool scene. Let's do that scene. Let's put that scene in rather than one that we've seen a million times. And it's all, uh, it, come, it can come down to how you choose to, to develop it. So scripts that don't quite work, I've seen that pattern with the third act. I've seen choices made uh, in terms of developing them that don't fit, um, that don't maximize the, the possibilities that are present uh, there. Um, there. There's the question of, which we have not talked about, uh, of dialogue. Uh, what dialogue is? Okay, so here, there's an interesting problem that, that you do see um, with with scripts that maybe don't work that well, um, is they have talk but no dialogue. Talk, spe human speech can be poetic, it can be witty, uh, clever, poet uh, 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 moving, but it isn't dialogue unless there's, there's action under it. And that's, oh, that's something to look for. There's really two elements of dialogue that you can learn about. It isn't, it isn't simply a, a, a talent. Some people have a natural talent and they can their ear for it and they capture it. But it, it goes beyond that. You can actually learn how to do this. Um, and by action, uh, well, let, let me explain it this way. Uh, in a dramatic scene, you'll often find not a dramatic scene, in a scene. <laughs> the problem is no drama. Uh, the students will come with Q and, what I call Q&A dialogue. How are you today? Okay, how about you? Well, not bad. I think I'll go to the store. What about you? Well, I think I'll not go to the store. You know, what, that's that's Q&A dialogue. Now, and it's, it doesn't really qualify as dialogue. It's useful to think of dialogue, especially in the rewrite stage, and I'd emphasize that. In the first drafts, pour it on the page, and don't worry if it's Q&A dialogue. Don't 
worry about it. It'll only block you up if you worry about it. But once it's on the page and you're thinking, if it's working and everybody loves it, you say, we're done. If it isn't working, there are some diagnostic tools you can use to study your dialogue and see what you can do with it. Um, there is this concept of subtext in dialogue. And I'll have to give you a warning that I use the term in a way different from pretty much everybody else. I've seen that used um, like in the McKee book, he talks about subtext and dialogue and there's a, there's a passage in there he says, well, let's say you have two lovers and they're at a table and it's beautiful and you know, the candle lit and one says to the other, darling, I love you, I love you, I love you. And, and he says, well, that's not actable because it's, it's too on the nose. This is what on the nose dialogue. And he says, well, that really needs to be subtext. You need subtext. And it'd be better if you give them an action. And he used the example of, of uh, a couple that's repairing a, a flat tire. And we get from that action that they're in love, but they don't ever say it. Okay. So, I mean, I look at that and I think, I have a feeling I've been in that situation where I've been with someone and I said, I love them. <laughs> and it was actable. <laughs> so they did it. Why isn't it actable? Well, that version of subtext, what it means, I've never found very helpful. I get the idea, okay, you want to say things without saying it, otherwise it's too on the nose. But I think it's more useful to think of subtext as the underlying verb. What am I doing? What am I doing in the scene? An actor is asked, what am I doing? And dialogue is action with words. That's all it is. It's somebody doing something, but they're using words instead of actions, physical actions. And so it's a useful thing when you have a scene that's already written to just see whether you can reduce each line of dialogue to a verb. And the kind of verbs you're looking for are things like attack, defend, deflect, um, persuade, seduce. Those are the kinds of verbs you want the, the lines to have. Okay? You don't want explain. <laughs> it's just emotionally neutral. And that's where the Q&A thing comes in. So. Uh, if you have the dialogue, how are you today? And the person says, well, I didn't sleep much last night. That's Q&A. But if you have a character who says, you look like hell. And they say, well, I didn't sleep much last night. You see, now you've got attack defense. Hey, I didn't sleep much. So you transform it into something that actually moves, that, that actually is uh, dynamic and we're following action. And that's, that's the other thing if you want to know what people, what's in the screenplay that works, that gets people going. One other element is that people follow action, which is somebody doing something or something doing something. And even in your description, you, you keep that in mind that in a stage play, you're going to list all this stuff that's on the stage. But in a movie, you want a character to walk through a room and pass by a, you know, fancy couch with a cat on it and move to and pick up a, you know, you want it to be all contained within action because people watch that. So that's subtext. I think it's a useful way of thinking of subtext. It's what's the action? What's the verb that's underlying it? And that's, you can stray from that a little bit, but most of the time you want that to be the case. You want to be able to identify what is the person doing? The question of on the nose dialogue is not related to subtext. On the nose dialogue is defined as characters say exactly what they are thinking. Um, and it's straightforward and it's boring. So in that example, okay, man says to the woman, I love you, I love you, I love you. And okay, so that is, that's a bit on the nose, let's say. Um, but the, the way to attack that, again, is in the rewrite stage, not when you're trying to come up with it, is there are simple, there are literary devices that are ancient that you can employ. And the easiest one is irony. You take a character um, who says, uh, you look like hell. Okay, that's a straightforward attack and says, you look beautiful. Just flip it completely upside down. And they'll be like, what do you mean? I couldn't sleep last night. You know, they'll <laughs> defend themselves because they're going to get it. Because a lot of human interaction is ironic. And there's, uh, we talked about it in the other book, the, um, the science of screenwriting, that there's, there are theories that uh, human beings, in order to function as a society, need to have plausible deniability. You need to test things out. Um, 
uh, around an explosive issue like sex. I mean, what if you're interested in um, somebody, but you're not sure you should ask them uh, out because maybe there's a problem. So you could uh, go up to them and tell them a story about there was this guy I know and he was really in love with this girl, but she was already involved with somebody. And, you know, and the other, the target of the seduction may know exactly they're talking about her, but uh, if the person says, I'm married, it says, well, I wasn't saying anything, I was just telling a story. <laughs> See? But um, so you have irony. Irony is basically saying two opposite things at the same time. And um, like, uh, it's, it's pouring rain. I love this weather. <laughs> and, and people get it. Uh, or um, nice shoes you got there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and people, people go, what's wrong with them? You know, they're going to understand it. It's in the tone and the way you do it. But it's like, I didn't say anything. I just said they're nice shoes. That's all. Right. Um, so irony is a useful one. Um, and uh, there's, um, what is it? In Trouble in Paradise, again, a great movie that everybody should watch. But there is a scene where there's two guys that are rivals for the same woman. And one of them goofed up. Uh, and uh, what did he, oh, he lost something that belonged to her on a date. And so the other guy's riding him. So what do they, 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 they meet each other in, the, in a, a shop where they're, you can buy another one of what she, a purse. <laughs> and the guy comes in, he says, oh, how are you doing, Major? He says, mm, you know, and then he says, you're looking fine, Major. He says, I've had enough of your insulting <laughs> remarks. <laughs> and right. it, it, it works really well. Okay. So um, irony is one. Then uh, another one is metaphor that you'll see. People speaking and people do this a lot. So instead of subtext, I think a preferred term would be indirection. Um, it's indirect speech, or sometimes you could call it conflicted speech, speech that's rich because it has double meanings. Uh, and a, a great example that I, I like from um, the um, double indemnity picture, it's a very famous scene in which a man is interested in a married woman. And he sa all he says is, when she says, my husband will be back at eight o'clock, he says, he implies, I don't want to see him anymore. I want to see you. And she says, there's a speed limit in this state, Mr. Neff, 45 miles an hour. And he says, how fast was I going, officer? She says, I'd say about 90. Says, Suppose you get off your motorcycle and give me a ticket. Suppose I'll let you off with a warning this time. You know, the whole thing is carried on indirectly through metaphor. And that is uh, a powerful way of doing it. Plus, he can say, hey, I was just talking about traffic. I was talking about a speeding ticket. I wasn't going after your wife. It's fine. So that's part of the reason you have it. But also having it in your script makes it richer, makes it like, wow, this is really po powerful. And that's the other thing to keep in mind about a screenplay as opposed to a novel is it's a limited amount of time. So it has to be richer. Every, they say a novel is drama, a novel is gossip, Drama is scandal. You know, everybody is, instead of walking, you're running. So if you have dialoguing, it's precious and you want it to be rich. So indirection can help. Um, another one is, uh, and by the way, in the social network is a great study if you want to look at how dialogue is done with indirection. He uses irony in an awful lot. Uh, and uh, a character saying, I'm heartbroken about that. And you know that he's just bullshitting them. Uh, or somebody saying, um, oh, this is really classy, you know, but said indirectly, I let, let me let the classiness waft over me, one character says, and it's clear he's mean, it's not. Or another one is a cease and desist letter, you know, I guess that cease and desist letter really scared the shit out of him. When he means it didn't have any effect, all he did, all that Sorkinson did was um, flip him into irony. But he also uses metaphor. Okay. Well, if these two characters want to stand on my shoulders and pretend they're tall, that's fine. Well, they're not, they're, they're big. They're not <laughs> going to stand on their shoulders. But he's using metaphor. Right. Uh -huh. um, uh, metonymy. Uh, something stands for something else. Again, going back to the social network. It's, uh, uh, th he tells a story about the founder of uh, the, um, uh, the founder of Victoria's Secret, who sold out too soon. He could have made 500 million. He only made 5 million. So he threw himself off the Golden Gate Bridge, 
right? That's the story that's told. And then he tells uh, Mark Zuckerberg character, you know, you don't want to sell it too soon because the waters of the Golden Gate are very cold. He doesn't have to say that it's, um, that you're going to regret this. That's on the nose dialogue is don't sell out too soon because you're going to regret this. If you say that the waters on the, are cold, then that's a much more powerful way of doing it. And that's metonymy is something standing for, for something else, a class of things. You know, the bridge stands for suicide or depression or failure. So that's, uh, that's what you can do to make dialogue not on the nose. And I would say uh, subtext you want in every line if you can. Uh, indirection is more like spice. You add it as needed uh, and look for opportunities, but people don't use it all the time. So you don't need to use it all the time. Yeah. Well, even in sharp objects where Amy Adams goes back to the little town that she was raised and she doesn't really want to be there. And she says in the beginning, you know, when they say, you know, bless your heart, that doesn't mean what it means. It basically means the opposite. Right. And that's what's so great about the show, too, is a lot of stuff is caged in this sweetness. Right. But it doesn't mean it. In fact, it is with, uh, I think her name is Eudora, the fantastic character played by Patricia Clarkson. Patricia Clarkson is the mother and she is so skilled at, the, at that kind of dialogue where a lot of stuff is said to kind of take the power away mm -hmm. from different characters and it's done so well. Yeah, well there's a movie I recently I saw recently again uh, going back a little further. Uh, it's called Bad Day at Black Rock with Spencer Tracy um, and it's not a western. It's set in Arizona but it's not a western um, and it involves a guy showing up in this small town where people, nobody's been, the train has not stopped in the last three years and it suddenly lets off this guy. It usually goes right on through. Nobody comes to Black Rock anymore. And everybody's acting real suspicious. Who is this guy? What does he want? And they, he's trying to get information to go find somebody. And the moment they mention the name, it's like nobody wants to help him. So, the dialogue is very functional. The indirect dialogue is very functional because he can't say, okay, did somebody murder them? What happened? Did somebody murder him? What, what's going on here? He's got to ask questions and they don't want to give him a lot of answers. So it's all this maneuver, verbal maneuvering and it's a sight to behold how they pulled that off. It's, worth, it's an exciting movie, but it's also worth looking at just for the, the way indirection is used, asking questions without asking them, answering them, uh, giving warnings to people without warning them, right. uh, that kind of thing. So it makes for rich screenwriting. So that would be another element if uh, the dialogue is has power to it. I mean, power in the sense of action and is not all on the nose. It uses indirection and the subtleties, the way humans actually do talk. Then it's going to be more successful. Um, and that's a it just takes practice and it just takes rewriting. That's all. It's not, uh, it's not that hard to do actually, especially irony. Just look at, look at your stuff and see what happens if the character says the opposite and, and find out. So I was watching a video the other day and it was from an art professor and he was talking about how good artists tend to be bad students. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how really, the, I mean, the ones that sit in the front row that are super smart and raise their hand, he says, may not be the best artist, the one, it's the one in the back with the hangover and the tortured love affair that <laughs> kind of has his head down, that's actually really going to be fantastic. I was wondering if the same is true for writers. Well, I wouldn't recommend having a hangover, okay? <laughs> if any young people are listening, don't abuse, don't self-medicate. Or a tortured love affair. Right, don't, yeah, tortured love affair, a uh, couple. Yeah, okay, a couple yeah, get, get a couple under your belt and then, yeah. yeah. Go okay. easy on those. <laughs> But um, the type of student, what's interesting about that? Um, I guess in terms of screenwriting, in terms of the students I've had, um, I've, had the, I've had the gamut. I've had the ones who are on time with their assignments while I sit around a table. So I don't know if they're in the front row. <laughs> I mean, they're kind of in the front row. And, and they turn in their work and really apply themselves and learn. And they can be, you know, Fulbright scholars or something. And then I've had the ones that are quirky and um, wind up 
surprising you with uh, what where did that come from um, I think the the key for a successful successful artist may be maybe where that comes from and I don't know what that person was talking about but exactly but people who take risks tend to not be 4.0 students because you could fail in other words if you're really focused on that then you try to be risk averse and okay I know I know somebody who wanted a 4.0 in college because uh, they wanted to get into med school it's hard to get into med school so he did what he could well this guy was like he was a ma- he was a major in the classics like which is a hard Greek and Latin but he was Greek <laughs> so he knew Greek so it wasn't a, a hard thing it was something that was going to be getting him a good grade without a risk of failing I mean I took ancient Greek I took a risk and it was not pretty <laughs> <laughs> okay but this person was actually playing it safe and then they were making sure all the courses were there was going to be organic chemistry that's going to be hard but while I'm doing that I'm going to do a bunch of safe things and then 4.0 um, so that may be the case and an artist or a creative person is going to tend to resist uh, rigidity they're going to probably challenge things uh, they're going to follow a, a unique path they're going to describe the world the way they see it the way they experience it and it's not going to conform to a pattern of grading it's going to conform to it's uh, it's going to the question will be whether it, if there's a way of connecting connecting with an audience um, so uh, that's that's what I've seen with that it's, it's really important to to trust and be willing to give it you know give it a shot try something you're not used to expose something you're not comfortable with maybe that may be where all the power is you can see students that might write an action movie and a superhero movie and then the one time they write something that is about their um, you know 400 pound uh, cousin who who steals people's ATM cards scams them so he can buy munchies <laughs> that's interesting you know uh, or the the father who absentee father who finally treated his daughter to a great day on her birthday and then found out he charged everything to her you know that's whoa you know okay that's not that that's unique and interesting and I want to see that um, in fact in the exercises we do in our introductory class one thing that I have the students do is write character profiles of people they know without telling them well how they're going to be used I say who's the biggest liar you know write up one page description that's going to help me understand what they're like uh, the most ambitious person you know uh, the the most religious that you know the most uh, uh, the most conceited uh, that kind of thing and um, then when when they bring them and they the more unique if they write a generic one you can tell if they're talking about someone they know then it gets very specific they, they have a real sense of the person then you take that person and say okay how about what if they were put in this situation what would they do and you wind up with an interesting story so um, is that a I think a studious dedicated student could do that as well as somebody who's got a hangover <laughs> it's, it's a matter of being open to digging down and finding out the truth about how you, how you experience things and then bringing it to bear on the story uh, Anna bring it to bear in story form connecting to an audience well and just following up with that then he also said that within each group of artists it's like a gang mentality in some sense and there's this unspoken rule about who the alpha is no one needs to identify and we everybody knows who that alpha is but then with the scapegoat in the group there's like this outlier sort of thing that comes out of that one scapegoat so we kind of know who the alpha is we know who the beta is we might know below that but there's this one scapegoated character and that one sometimes can be the the sort of shocking uh, revelatory artist that, oh the one that everybody rejects right and kind of poo poos and doesn't have the same credentials maybe and then some like magical thing comes out of that I don't know interesting well I uh, again I don't know what field of art that was exactly but art visual arts let's say 
There's a, the, the difference is that screenwriters have a mass audience that they're trying to connect with. And the visual arts don't have that as much anymore. So the tendency, I think, there tends to be on focusing on expression. How do you express this? And who's really good at expressing it? And who can uh, be outrageous, as you say, that kind of thing. Uh, and then in that sense, you might have a focus on the creators, like a gang of people that are, one of them is the alpha, That's because they're all working on their expression. And this guy expresses is really powerfully a girl, and this one doesn't. I'm just speculating. Whereas in screenwriting, it's really about what that person does. If they're if they're like capturing scenes really vividly, okay, I, I don't want to follow them, but I want to find out how they're doing that, because then I want to do it. Uh, I had a, <coughs> a, a, a fellow student at, when I was in grad school who just. She lived the biker life. I mean, she had been immersed in it. And man, the kinds of scenes she wrote, it wasn't just that it was so authentic, but the way she had the dialogue and the scenes was just like you were there. So it was like, I wouldn't consider her a gang leader or anything or part of a gang. You have friends. But it was, I got to see, I got to sit down and sit in a bar and listen to people and see whether I can capture the kind of ambiance that she's doing. Uh, and try to learn from her. So, um, so offhand, I don't. Maybe I'm not much involved in the students' lives, but, but I don't see them in that way, forming that kind of what you're describing. Um, as far as screenwriting professionals, you know, again, there's. It's. I don't know how much there are certain influences that happen, and uh, but it's pretty much whatever you can do to apply your craft to get the next job is what counts, as opposed to, well, let me put it this way too, that screenwriting is, the end product is not the screenplay. That's a little different. Uh, in a, It's changing, hopefully. But when you're a visual artist, you're doing it. There it is. You're not describing on paper something you'd like to do. And everybody's sitting around talking about the things that they've, they're describing. It's everybody comparing their artwork. Uh, whereas the screenwriter is, they're going to try to get, the, the, whether it's successful is a matter of sales and recognition, and, and it's out there, it's not among peers, that sort of thing. Now, it, by changing, if we get to the point where more writers are generating their own material and making things because production and distribution has changed, then maybe you'll see that. And certainly among a bunch of filmmakers getting together, who does what? And they, then they would be closer to the artist experience than the, the not virtual artist, but potential artists. We're, we have our story here, just give me a few million dollars and we'll turn it into a feature film. Um, if we can go beyond that, then it could be more like that. So then we'll talk. In 10 years, we'll see where it is and we'll get back to it. We'll find out if the gangs are there in the screenwriting. <laughs> Can you give me an example of an unreliable narrator? What is that? Unreliable narrator? What would be... Can you give me an example of a movie that had that? I'm trying to think. Well, I hear people use that a lot. And I was just curious, how is that different from a reliable narrator? So let's suppose we think take Kevin Spacey's voiceover in um, American Beauty. Right. So I would say that would be a reliable narrator, wouldn't it? Because right. he's talking about his own life. Right. Um, but an unreliable narrator, I'm, I've heard the term bandied around and I was curious. Well, I've seen it in fiction. I'd have to think about movies. Okay. Uh, fiction, an unreliable narrator. Uh, an example that I read recently would be a book called The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. And this is one in which it's a story about a platoon or a squad of soldiers in Vietnam. But the narrator is, it's told in the first person, as I recall. But let me think about that. I'm not sure, that, not sure it's in the first person. But the narrator is describing these events very vividly. But sometimes he changes what happened in a later chapter. Or he'll reflect on the meaning of 
of um, storytelling in you know kind of meta in that way. The narrator will say that's what happened, but but you can't always tell a war, whether a war story is real or not, and and then he'll describe it a slightly different way, um, or a bunch of different ways you might think about it. And he, he even talks. He has a digression about how to tell a real war story from from a fake one. If it elevates you, if it makes you inspired, it's a lie. If it's if it has if it's an obscenity that has no redeeming quality, that's a real story. <laughs> that's what really happened. Um, so that's an example in a um, in a novel. In terms of a screenplay, um, I, I guess I would have to see an example of it. Yes, I've heard of that. Um, it's not something that I deal in particularly. Um, so it's for fiction writing. Maybe I'm mistaken then, because it sounds like it's just for fiction. I'm writing. sure it's been attempted in cinema. Yeah. Um, maybe there's a movie called Blow Up. You know, I don't uh, from the '60s, like 1966. And I think if you looked at a literary critique of it, that might be one that's considered to have an unreliable narrator because we're not really certain whether a murder happened or not. Um, and uh, so what? What did we just see exactly? I mean, probably as soon as the interviews, then I'll think of maybe another example. But sure. um, I think because cinema is so rigorously real, I mean, it, it relies on mechanical reproduction of of life. If something that we're shown, we're we're assuming it's happening, and if it isn't, or if it turns out that didn't happen, that may be a very frustrating experience for the audience because I've invested in this and now I'm not sure what that was. Um, so yeah, I'm not a lot of help on that one, but I, I'll, I'll research it and get back okay, to Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> Do you think it's misleading or selling false hope to have screenwriting books, to teach courses, to give people the idea that they can actually make a living mm -hmm. as a screenwriter? Um, it depends on how it's sold. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll give you an example. Um, a few years ago, maybe a decade ago now, on, on Chapman's own website, they had a, a very clever kind of uh, marketing thing. And it was um, uh, a clapboard, you know, and it said on it, um, uh, your, it said like student's name, and then the feature film was your movie career. You know, and, and I looked at that and I contacted the dean. You have to take that down. You're saying that people will get a career out of this. That's like, you can't say that. You can't sell the school on that idea because it's so difficult. Um, you have to, yes, you're going to try to nurture them. You're going to try to help them um, be the best filmmakers they can be. But to say, to, to have like a warranty that yeah, at the end of this, you'll, you'll have a job is not something that, that's ethical. Um, the question of the function of the books and the function of the, of the film school. Uh, actually, I saw it, uh, I'll quote somebody I saw just on, online recently, Martin Scorsese, saying if you, if you want to pursue film because you think you'd like a career in it, then don't do it. If you want to pursue film because you, you will always be making films and you can't stop it, then do it. Um, and that's how I see it. I, we have students that come in. Um, what was it? I used to tell the, in, the prospective students. I don't know if I ever got in trouble for it, but I would tell them, no, I would tell them, they're all eager and they, they're thinking they're going and want to go to film school. I'd say, if you can do anything else and be happy, do it. And then before they got accepted, before they applied, if you can do anything else, because this is going to be really, really hard, and uh, you'll have doubts, and <coughs> most people don't have a career in it. But if you have that fire inside, you have a, the other point of view, which is, um, at some point, well, let me tell you a personal story. Uh, when when my my first wife was was passing away she was in hospice okay and in the same room there was somebody who i couldn't tell if it was a man or woman it was this figure very ancient 
kind of like that. Uh, if it was time for a bath, the people came in, gave them the bath. If the TV was on all day, I don't know whether anybody was wa actually watching it. And I, I thought, I looked at that, I said, you, that's a reality. That's going to be you someday. And when you're in that position where you can't take a bath without somebody giving it to you and you haven't really given it a shot, like do something that's really exciting, you haven't done that, you're not even going to be able to go like that. You're going to have to ask the nurse to do that. And you, that's the reality. There's wanting to do this thing and the fact that you're going to be in that place and we're all going to be there. What, what do you want it to be when you look back? Um, and so if you don't do it, uh, and a lot of people actually, they come out and then they find a niche somewhere else in the business. They don't uh, have a movie made. Uh, and some will find it very interesting, but we have a really brilliant writer, graduated a few years ago, was a double major and got a great scholarship to study psychology as a grad student and is brilliant. And that's the direction she went. Um, she now has an inside sense of what it's like to tell a story, see a movie, and never see a movie the same again once you've studied it. But um, she uh, took a different path. So I don't think it was a, a waste for her. She was actually really good. Um, so the question of the ethics of it, I think if people are interested in it, they're going to avail themselves of whatever they can. And it's up to them to try to see what's possible in their life. Um, if you, yeah, but if you were to sell uh, a product and say, this will get you in, this will be your ticket, uh, this is the way to do it, um, then that's more on the edge. You don't want to raise people's hopes like that. You want to be honest with them. And, uh, and we live, you know, at a, at a time, like I say, that the technology and distribution has changed. You may wind up making movies. They may just be smaller. They may be, you don't make a living at it. You do something else, but you are still making movies and you do it all your life. I, I know one person I've collaborated with who's about 81 years old and he had a very successful career as a, as a director and a producer. But he's 81, and when you're 81, everybody you know is dead, you know, or they're not in the business anymore. But he's out there working with students. He's working with, you know, he works in the, at the Ruskin Theater directing. He, he just wants to, this guy will do it until he can't do it anymore. And it doesn't matter if he gets paid or not. He'd love to be paid, but he wants to be on a set with actors, working with them, creating magic for an audience. And that's in him, it's in his blood, and that's what he's going to do. So, Did you ever personally experience naysayers? Naysayers? Yeah. Meaning? Oh, people that <clears throat> tried to persuade you to do something else. <laughs> or, or, or told you flat out, you'll never do this. You'll never even, even you know, yeah. sell a screenplay, whatever. Have, did you encounter that? And Right. Well, I had this experience once of, well, you, you get a lot of it. You know, when you're, when you're a potential writer as opposed to a writer. But actually, once you're writing, you're writing. Forget it. That's it. But you might have the impression, and I did, that, okay, well, I have potential here, but it's not realized, and I gotta, maybe it won't happen. And then you have friends that are going on and having families and doing stuff. Um, and I remember one time, I had a, like I said, Frank Danielle was this remarkable teacher. Well, I, I, he helped me write the thesis screenplay, but then a few years out of school, you know, and I was trying to do a follow-up, that one had gotten me an agent and got me recognition and maybe gets my career started, but I found that in, without his guidance, the, the follow-up script was really hard and I was struggling. And then I said, well, I'll, I'll get into playwriting where I'll have an audience and, and get my spark back. And I went to this theater, this writing class in, in uh, at a play in New York, a uh, theater in New York City, and came home one day just so frustrated, and I, I decided, that's it, I'm not going to do this anymore. 
want to do something else? That's it. And this voice in my head said, I wonder if there's a story in this. <laughs> I wonder if I could turn this into a story. <laughs> okay, somebody who's so dead, they're going to give up. And that's when I realized it's never going to go away. It's, gonna, it's just part of you and it's, you're going to do this. And I turned that into a play that won me uh, the first prize I won in, in, for writing. I won my first $100 um, in San Francisco. It was oh, nice. done up in San Francisco. Um, but uh, so that that's an, maybe an example of naysayers. But certainly, people uh, don't don't get it. Or, uh, but it's it's about what uh, you want to do with the bulk of your waking hours. Is that something that excites you? So, and also the flip side of that is um, a Tuesdays with Maury. Did you did, where it's him advising Mitch Album not to chase success and to stop and sort of see the life around him. So there's, there's that as well, that whole... Oh, right, of um, smelling the roses kind of thing. Because I've heard of that, but I've not read that. Oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah. it's great. You can also go on... It's, it's based on a real guy. I think Maury Schwartz is his name. Yeah, and so he's fantastic in these interviews. And, um, you know, it's a very touching story. And I think, you know, Mitch is still writing. And uh, Well, yeah. that's it's true. You, you have this idea of um, nostalgia, and most people think I think of nostalgia as seeing the past wrongly. You don't see it properly because it's rose-colored glasses or it's, it's an idealized version of your past. But it occurred to me a few years ago what nostalgia really is. It's experiencing moments in your past uh, stripped of any anxiety for the future. Because when you're in that situation, when you're, I mean, when I think about it, in New York City, you're sitting among friends at a cafe eating eclairs and having coffee and talking about stories and it's like you're 25 years old and you have all this, what could be better? And you stay there until the, the guy throws you out. You got to <laughs> get another eclair or we're going to get out of here because we got to have this table. And it, it, But at the time, you're worried about, well, is this a waste of time? Am I doing this right? Am I, maybe this is all foolish. So it's harder to experience that joy. So this key to living, of course, is to experience every day as nostalgia, like stripped of the, this anxiety. But that maybe is what, what he's talking about, that you, you have these moments and those moments are, are you're actually living. This is, you're, you're actually doing it. You're not about to do it and you're not striving to do it. You're doing it right now and that's what you do. So, yeah. Passive versus active main character? Mm-hmm. What's the difference? Oh, okay, passive versus... This is an opportunity situation because most people assume and most movies are about somebody who's active and they got to do something. Um, but there are successful pictures where you have someone who's not. And how do those work? That's, that's what you look for. You say, well, everybody says do this and this one doesn't, but it still works. So why? Well, what did they do that, that compensated for it? Because obviously, if you have an active main character, it's easy to watch. You're going to see whether they get what they want or not. And it's all taken care of. But what about that? Well, what you'll see is um, uh, there still has to be conflict. As long as there's conflict, you'll be okay. Uh, because the conflict will, will create the suspense and the tension that sustains us. If you're using dramatic tension as a main tool. Um, not all movies do. There are like ensemble pieces that will be following a bunch of different stories of different characters and the unifying element is a milieu, like diner. It's about a diner. It's what happens in a diner. Um, and as long as it's understood by the audience that that's what they're watching, you know, you can signal that that's what it's about. In fact, that movie was a 1982 picture. <coughs> um, I believe the opening title is like a week before Christmas 1959 or something like that maybe 1958, and then it's about the Baltimore Colts and all this stuff. But it gives you a sense right away from the opening, it's going to take place in about a week. Okay, I think it actually starts Christmas Eve, and it's going to t it takes place in a week. Okay, so that frames it, and then you have an ensemble uh, people, and there, there's dramatic conflicts within those, but the overall picture doesn't have, doesn't utilize dramatic tension as, a, as the main tool. So you don't have that. You have first acts of all the different characters and the different subplots. And each subplot has its own act structure. Um, generally, there are a couple that kind of dangle off and disappear, but most of them, the main ones do. Um, but if we go back to the main, the most common form, which is 
character with an objective and there's obstacles, an active one helps. But uh, there was a, a famous editor I was told about, and I don't remember who it was, who said the, the secret to the craft is that all scenes are either chases or escapes. It's either somebody trying to get something or trying to avoid something. And a passive character can be somebody who's just trying to avoid something. And the key is to build a circumstance where that's hard. Like uh, the uh, Lars and the Real Girl talked about that. Uh, this is a movie where the, you have a passive main character. He's, he just wants to, all he wants to do is it's an escape story because the whole town is united to try to not let him do what he wants to do by the very indirect means, playing along with him. But you can see the tension is there is what surrounds the question is, is he ever going to get better? Um, so there, that would be a passive main character. Or I like Cuckoo's Nest. What does this guy want to do? He wants to avoid doing work. <laughs> he wants to play cards. He doesn't have any agenda beyond that. But the way the story is constructed, he's placed in the worst possible situation for his unique characteristics, which is that he's He's a noble person who wants to help people, uh, you know, but he has an opportunity. He's, and, and this world crushes him. So that, that's something you can look for. Um, where is the graduate, there? I think. Sorry. The graduate that. is right. He doesn't have to pursue her. I do have an analysis of the graduate in the book. Um, he doesn't have to pursue her. She's in his lap. There's nothing there. But it, it, what keeps us suspended there is, is actually that's not an escape movie it's dramatic irony <laughs> you look at the middle part of that it's an example of a movie where the second act is actually not that long it's about equal size with the first and third acts the second act is about will he get caught and you you have comic iron comic irony played with where and and sometimes dramatic irony where the mother inquires where do you go every night he, you know he cuts himself while shaving you can see he's not comfortable answering oh, i just drive or in the hotel where everybody recognizes him. He's with the girl and, and uh, the Catherine Ross, the actress. She's with Is Elaine. Or, oh, uh, yeah. And, and at the hotel where he's been having these liaisons and everybody knows him. <laughs> and he's trying to conceal from her what, what, what was happening. So that's one. Um, the uh, Sunset Boulevard is a, a movie about a guy who's trying to hustle this uh, older woman uh, he's a writer he's trying to hustle her and after a certain point really from the mid middle of the movie on he's he's very passive he's he's just it's kind of avoiding the world so but that's it's an escape in that way he's trying to just stay away from everything and the world intrudes but largely that one is sustained by um, a little bit of tension about someone trying to not let him escape uh, and uh, voiceover narration, which keeps us, it's a form of telegraphing. You know, this is about to happen, or little did I know this would happen, that kind of thing, so that we're anticipating. Um, so that's, that, uh, so the answer to the question, can you have a passive main character, we'll look for where the conflicts are. If the character is passive, never wants to do anything, can you put them in a situation that challenges that and makes them, uh, fight. What is a midpoint reversal? Midpoint reversal. Uh, that is, you'll see, we're talking classically constructed works, but often what you see is this. Let's say it's a dramatic piece. You're using dramatic tension. So the end of the first act is you have the main character wants the, the money that they're owed. <laughs> and the end of the second act, you're going to get some kind of resolution of that. Um, if, uh, if you go with the idea that the, they're going to get it in the end, the resolution of the movie, if they get it, the end of the second act is often the point where it doesn't look like they're going to get it. Okay? The midpoint is usually the mere opposite. Looks like they are going to get it. It's just a, a game of contrast that the character tries a different things and you see possible glimpses of outcome. And I, again, I'll, I'll lean on Toy Story. This is a moment when uh, they're at Pizza Planet and it looks like they're going to get home. Because, okay, we're going to jump in this stroller and we're out of here. And that's the closest they get. And it looks like that could be it. And then the, the movie's going to be over. And then that's exactly the moment when 
it goes the other way and he gets caught by Sid and they wind up in this horrible torture chamber. So that, that's, that's an example. But it's a, an opportunity to give us a glimpse of how that, what the ending could be like. Um, sometimes it's, like if it's a tragedy, it could be the um, high point. You know, in classic drama, like 19th century, it would be the point where uh, the first half is character doing stuff. The second half of the play is stuff do happening to the character. Whatever they started doing starts coming back on them. Uh, in a tragedy, it could be the high point is the, the high point. You know, the midpoint is the high point. It's the place where, uh, in, going back to Cuckoo's Nest, that there looks like he, he says, I'm, I'm out of here in 98 days. I've succeeded. I I'm, I'm, don't have to go back to the prison. And so it looks like he won. because That's his objective is I don't want to work. I don't want to go back to prison. And then he finds out, no, you're here forever now. <laughs> you're not in prison anymore. You're here forever. And that changes the, the dynamics. Um, so, oh, uh, and Sunset Boulevard, he, he makes a decision. I'm leaving. I'm leaving her. He gets trapped in this life with this woman at this mansion. He's, he's totally dependent on her. He finally makes a decision. I'm leaving. I can't stand this anymore. And he goes out and leaves this mansion. And he goes to a party with all his friends. And he's having a good time. And what happens? He gets a call. And it's the woman that he was with has tried to commit suicide. Now he's got to go back. So he gets, we get this moment where, of a possible outcome. He's gonna, he gets away. And then it goes down. It's a tragedy. So that's the high point. And it travels down. It's, it's just, uh, midpoint's an opportunity to use contrast uh, in cinema. Contrast works. We, if the outcome is positive, it could be, if the second act and the second act is negative, it could be positive, vice versa. Uh, tragedy, it's, it works a different way. Um, some people use it um, as when they have the idea of the second act being broken in two or act three and four and the wait, two and three is the, the middle. Uh, it could be a place where tension changes. And if you're observing sequences, that's the point where uh, you'll have a break between two sequences. But it's certainly a place when you're developing a story to look for the possibilities of how the story could plausibly end. And then you're, in, you're God. You can make it not end there. But look at what, what the possibilities are. You could also use it as a break point where you can make a whole new movie. This is uh, Shop Around the Corner, where in the midpoint, I told you the story, neither character knows <coughs> that they're in love with the other. They think they hate each other, but they're in love with somebody else. At the midpoint, one of them figures it out. So the first part of the story is uh, people in a shop. The second part of the story is people in a shop, two of them are in love and they don't know it. Okay. The next story we see, that's two stories. The next story we see is that same situation, but one of them does know uh, what happens. And then finally, the ending is both know. So it's a way, of, okay, you got this premise. How are you going to explore all the different ways it, it, could, it could go? And all the scenes you could come, get out of it. Um, uh, the apartment. Billy Wilder is just, it's worth looking at all his movies because he's a, he knew how to, it's a textbook of screenwriting. But the apartment is um, the, the middle of the story is again a suicide attempt uh, where this uh, person is pursuing this woman and is very upset because he finds out she's with somebody else. And then um, the second half of that second act is about nurturing that woman back to health after a suicide attempt. Um, so it, it's a situation that we get a glimpse of his life without her in the middle. And then end of the second act, we get uh, a glimpse of him with success without her. And then the third act is the resolution is he gets her, but he doesn't have the job. So it's three very contrasting moments. Um, but Again, midpoint, some people will say act one, then act 2A and act 2B. Uh, divide it that way. And you have kind of a subtle change in the, what the um, tension is in the subject matter in the two halves of the second act.
midpoint. Well, so midpoint reversal, um, it depends. It could be, uh, depending on how you re re define it, if it's Toy Story, the reversal is that he winds up at Sid's house. And that's right in the middle of the story. Rather than, it's a reversal from what his hope is. Uh, reversal of fortune, that kind of thing. So, Is there anything you want your students to know before they begin writing a screenplay? Before they begin writing a screenplay, what they should know. Is there anything they should know before writing a screenplay? Yeah, I guess there is one. Um, am I passionate enough about this project to spend six months on it? Am I, do I really care that much? Because <laughs> it's going to be tough sledding at some point. And um, in fact, my, my old mentor had a couple of suggestions. I forget if I shared these. There, he had a couple of interesting suggestions for how to deal with when the going gets really rough. Um, he said uh, that what you do when you get your inspiration for this script, and it's going to be the greatest script you ever anybody ever wrote, then what you do is you type it out on a piece of paper. Type it out. We don't do that. Write it out on a computer and then print it out later. What the reviews are going to be, what your speech is going to be at the Academy Award, what historians are going to say about this script and how great it is. You put all that on a piece of paper and you seal it in an envelope. You put it away somewhere carefully. And then when you're writing it and you're in the middle of it and everything is, sucks, everything is like every, every scene you write tastes like yesterday's oatmeal. You know, it doesn't work. And, you're, and you say, I'm done, I'm giving up. He said, that's when you reach for your envelope because it reconnects you with what that initial inspiration was. Now, in my experience doing that, I never had to reach, I was always like, what if that fails? I better not reach for it, I'll keep going. <laughs> but knowing it's there helped. You know, it's like, oh, this is not working. So before they begin, are they passionate enough about the subject matter to whether the pain that it's going to cause to to do it to write it yeah i like that idea so so right when you're like there's a spark and you're just yeah. so into it you're writing not the script you're writing All the reviews the yes. your acceptance speech you're up there you're in your dress or your talks whatever and right. you're thanking everyone and and how it's changed the course of culture or whatever culture of cinema history. yes <laughs> and and then you keep that there wow interesting yeah it's it's an interesting technique. Great tool. He also said, don't write to the edge. When you're writing a scenes, you don't, um, if you got the idea of how the scene will end, don't finish it. Stop and make a few notes about how you're going to finish it. And then that way when you pick up the next day, you're not starting over again. You're like, oh, that's where I was. And you can pick up where you left off. So never write all the way to where you no longer have any more ideas. <laughs> um, stop just before then and then keep plowing ahead the ne next time. So that's something I do all the time, um, just to make sure that I um, always know what's, what's coming next. And he said, don't write if you're not excited. Get whatever your technique is, whether it's listening to music or getting up and pacing around the room, but get excited about what you're doing because that, that'll show through what you're doing, and the passion comes through. So when the student does begin the screenplay, how should they start? How should they start? Um, um, I, I could tell you how I start, because I don't, they'll have their own approaches. If, they, if they're beginning a screenplay, if they have a treatment already, then obviously they just they should just pour it on the page. What are they seeing? Hallucinate. What is it? And don't set aside the critical element. You know, is it this or is it accomplishing? Is it this tool or that? And forget all that. Just pour it on the page and follow this and hallucinate what is happening and write down, imagine it and write down what it is. That, that's how they begin. When I'm writing a, a draft of a script, I don't format it in any way. It's just the dialogue. Just a long list of the dialogue, um, and just so that it'll keep flowing, and it's not—it's just a lot. The key is to make it feel like it's fully alive, and people don't live with properly formatted dialogue. They just things flow, uh, and so when they're just starting out, just pour it on the page, hallucinate, 
try to have fun with it, be excited about it. <coughs> to me, music makes all the difference. You know, come up with the right score that gets you excited. And, um, and when I say hallucinate, imagine it. Imagine what the audience is going to experience. Have the fun that they're going to have with it. Um, there's uh, this idea of imagination. Uh, in, in a screenplay, in order to do screenwriting, you've got to have imagination. But most people think that means the imagination involved in coming up with an interesting character, an interesting story. That's true. <coughs> but that's only part of it. There's really three parts, I think, in the, that imagination comes into play. The second part is coming up with imaginative uh, solutions to story problems. Because you'll run into those. You'll come in, you'll, you'll write your draft, and then somebody will say, well, this, it doesn't work from page 30 on because of that. And you don't want to throw out 90 pages. So you say, well, why isn't it working? Oh, I bet we can solve it this way. We, we go this way. Um, and then that'll take care of that problem. Uh, and sometimes uh, it, it, it can be something very simple. But being imaginative about solving these problems. Um, then the third part is being able to constantly imagine that you are the audience that hasn't seen it before. That you're watching it for the first time and keeping track of that. Uh, what are we seeing? What, what are my expectations? What am I afraid of? That, that part of it. And that's fun. You know, you are, you, you're inspired to make movies because you are thrilled by movies. So be that, let that thrill happen while you're writing it. This is exciting what you're doing. So. Should a writer be more dialed in to what the audience is thinking or what that character, I mean, what, what if I'm so in the mindset of the character that I'm writing about, the protagonist, how am I able to remove myself and imagine the audience? Uh, well, if you can get so into the character that you lose track of what's going on, that's great. Um, and you could always fix it in the rewrite. That's what rewrites are for. You've got a character who's fully alive and immersed and doing things, and then you you give it to someone or you reread it and something is either confusing or it's lost its thread or this or that, then you can always go back and construct it in an interesting way. But getting the characters to come fully alive is, is a great uh, um, uh, accomplishment that, that will help you. Um, they, this, uh, this phenomena that the writers do talk about, and I've seen it in, even again in 19th century writings about theater, this experience that the character, I didn't really write that, the character wrote it. The character's really alive and they did that. And I've had that experience and other writers when it's good, that's what it feels like. I just, I'm just the witness who writes down what they're saying. I, I don't know where it came from. And it comes from somewhere inside. But um, so at some point, that's more the critical side, but still it's fun to imagine you're the audience and wondering and, and being involved in experiencing this and watching that character do these things and wondering how they're going to deal with the next crisis, whatever it might be. What screenwriting skills are hard to learn but will pay off later down the line <laughs> and pay dividends? Screen, what'll make you rich? Let me tell you. <laughs> Actually, in the last chapter of that new book, I said how George did it. You know, this was an, I did an analysis of Star Wars. I said the title of the chapter is how George did it, or can I make $4 billion too, or something like that. But I did, I put an asterisk, results not guaranteed. <laughs> That's good. I don't want to get sued. <laughs> I'll make a billion. Okay, what skills are hardest to learn and... Will um, pay off later, and not necessarily monetarily, but just pay off later. Pay in off terms in terms of, of your writing. artistic abilities. What's wrong with that? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey man, it's about the art. Yeah, <laughs> it's about doing it, you know what I'm saying? Uh, a skill that's hard, hard for screenwriters to learn. Maybe it's just taking notes. I don't know. Sorry, I'm interjecting. Oh, taking notes in terms of uh, people giving you notes? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, is that sort of a, its own skill? Well, that, that involves listening in two ways. One is, well, there's a difference between analysis and response. Someone who gives you notes is often giving you a response. Well, I, this didn't work for me. And then you have to take that and filter it through analysis and figure out why isn't it. And that, that certainly takes skill. Um, but I think uh, the skill that's really, it's learning, I think, how to flesh out a character 
I think that takes longer for most. Some they start with character right away, but to get us in the to have, develop techniques by which you get a sense of who a character is and really portray them in a vivid way, that's a skill that pays off because because you're you're not writing actually you're not writing characters you're writing roles you're writing a role for an actor and so if that character is really exciting it's an act it's a role that an actor would want to play and that that's very helpful uh, yeah i can be that person you know um or that would be a challenging role for me to play so to i think that takes life experience to, to learn about people that so it takes longer um and there are techniques that that you can learn. Um, there are, if you have an opportunity to take an acting class and see the exercises that, that actors do, and they are all about what would this character do in this situation and what uh, are the choices they make and what choices, how would they express what they're doing. Um, so I think if you can master the creation of really memorable roles, that, that's very, that could pay off. What's funny is you talked about you know uh, trying to make the next Star Wars franchise or whatever. Just listening to the um, behind the scenes for Carrie with Brian De Palma, mm -hmm. I think he talked about they shared the same casting space for uh, Star Wars at that time. So oh, really? they would be like, you know what, I don't want this person, but why don't you have them? And so I think one of the people uh, had tried out for the Han Solo role or one of them and they said actually no I'll, Brian De Palma said I'll take him and so he ended up as the boyfriend I think in Carrie so they were kind of like sharing oh, this casting right, space that, that, he right. was in The Greatest American Hero he was yes. yeah he's great yeah I've, forgive me blanking on the name but forget yeah what what his name is Whether don't tell him that we forgot his name I'm sure it's 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 uh, he's a great actor but he, he, is, he, yeah, he did excellent. a lot of good stuff but um yeah, interesting. But my point is that it, it, at that time, you know, here he's, they're 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 sharing this casting space. They don't have any idea the implications of really both those movies. Sure. And uh, you know, it's, it was quote the quote unquote passion projects. And I think Sissy Spacek was not even the original choice for Carrie. She was a makeup artist, or she was a set designer, really? and she kept kind of pushing. I, I want to be a part of this project, and. Uh, Interesting. They well, said, "All right, well, we will we'll test you again," and you know. And it worked out. It did. Carrie's seventy six, and Star Wars is seventy seven. Is it? I, yeah. Yeah, oh. I think Carrie came out in seventy. Yeah, early, maybe early seventy seven. Mm. So that was the same time. Well, see, the characters didn't know what the story was going to be about. That's our human condition. They didn't know what was ahead. But uh, so, yeah. Didn't didn't necessarily plan it to be a franchise, so, right? Yeah. <laughs> What is top-down construction versus bottom-up? Okay. Well, th these are terms that come from constructivist psychology, and the uh, idea is that bottom-up stimulus uh, is where you see something in the world, and it goes into your brain, and it's stored there, and you're, you're, it's a process of learning, and um, from the observations of life, uh, you have uh, object recognition and development of schemas. Object recognition is obviously uh, something that has um, wings and a beak and you know flutters like this. Hummingbird, object recognition. <coughs> um, schema is like um, cake with candles on it, party favors, balloons, birthday party. It's a conceptual framework. Um, so, but you have to learn those things, and then they become um, uh, embedded in your in your memory, in your storage area. Top down means that in after that's happened, when you see something, you compare the new stuff with the schemas and the object recognition that you already have stored up. You compare, and you come to a conclusion about what it is you're seeing. It's a short way of shorthanding. I don't have to, if I just take a glance and see <coughs> the party streamers and the cake and the ice cream, I don't have to examine the whole thing to figure out what it is. I compare it to a stored memory, say, oh, birthday party. So um, when, where that comes in, in in screenwriting is, and in filmmaking generally, is that we only get incomplete information 
and we piece it together, just like we piece together the story, we, piece, we construct an understanding based on the schemas in our uh, memories. So that when um, in Some Like It Hot, you see the birthday cake and party and all that, and we think birthday party, but then a guy comes out, pops out of the top of the machine gun and shoots everybody. <laughs> that's a schema violation. You know, that's like we, we come to one conclusion, it turns out to be something else. In that case, they let us know there was a guy that was going to do that. But um, in, in, uh, when you're telling a story cinematically, you can exploit the idea that you can give incomplete information and audiences will c- construct it and anticipate where you're going based on schemas and then you can introduce new information that changes uh, our understanding of the situation. Um, so what's, uh, I, I mentioned that movie Top Secret that used that a lot, where you have people <coughs> that are uh, things we've seen before, a guy on a train and out the window, the platform is going by, and then we see that it's actually the train is st- standing still. The platform was being pulled. <laughs> you know, so we have a schema. We recognize that, and then we see the um, what's actually happening. I think it's violated. So it can be used for a gag. They actually, uh, with this uh, idea of, uh, it's been used as a gag, non-diegetic dialogue or, or sound, like you have a convention, a schema, that uh, in a suspense scene you're going to have music. Right, and the character doesn't hear it, and the characters don't hear it. It's non, not part of the world of the story, but that's something we understand. If you were didn't have any knowledge of it, you might think any music is going to come from what you're seeing. In fact, I think in the early days of sound, they did that. They had uh, Al Jolson singing. When you're getting music, it's singing, and he's doing it. But it, uh, the concept of having incidental music derived probably from theater, from uh, opera, um, was brought in. And so a new concept or new uh, schema arises, which is uh, the, um, what do you call it, the soundtrack music or the incidental music. And you can have a situation where, like in Blazing Saddles, the guy's riding his horse and there's a band playing music and then he pulls up and it's, you know, Count Basie and his orchestra is out in the desert playing so that uh, or the what is it stranger than fiction you know where there's voiceover dialogue about this guy who's going through a normal day and he always brushes his teeth the same way and the voiceover saying that and at one point uh, he stops and says, where's that coming from <laughs> you know and so we get that that violation of our schema and, and it's used in that sense for comic effect and Monty Python did the same thing with that with uh, Swamp Castle, when the young man tries in in the Holy Grail, he tries singing a song. He's in despair. He wants his true love. And and the father comes in and says, no, no music. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing a song. (laughs) That kind of thing. Did they do that in the airplane movies too? Um, They kind of played off of... um, The same people who did Top Secret did the airplane movies. So I very likely, I'd have to think about examples of um, where, well, certainly things like the jet plane making a, a drone like a prop plane throughout the whole movie, you know, that, that's something contrary to what our schema is. Um, and uh, that's it. Yeah, I'm sure there's other examples sure. from that. I'd have to look at it again, which would not be a problem. Yeah, I miss the movies. Movie. Yeah, I haven't seen them in a while. <laughs>